Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. Hey guys, it's Johnny, and welcome to episode 223 of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. I'm here catching up with the old friend, Josh Miltes. Is, how do you say your name? Uh, Josh Millets. Millets. I, you know, I don't think I ever knew how to say it. <laughs> it's all right. So actually, so I haven't seen you in like nine years or eight years yeah i think the last time we saw each other is when you had a layover in korea that yeah. was like 2013 that was a long time ago yeah yeah and we went to have some korean barbecue for lunch yeah, that was really good yeah that was cool okay so uh before we get to that part of it it's been a long journey but how did we actually meet do you remember yeah so actually one of my earliest memories of you was we were sparring partners in the intermediate class at tiger Muay Thai in phuket and uh I actually remember thinking like, oh man, this, this guy can kick. And I remember asking you, I was like, hey, like, have you ever done Taekwondo or anything like that? And you were like, no. And I was like, oh. So I just remember us sparring together. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I remember us training in Phuket together. Th- yeah. Those were the days. That was like a, that was like oh, a whole man. nother life ago. Yeah. That, that road has really changed a lot. That whole scene has really changed. It's been, it's been so developed since we were there. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from so many people. So uh, if anyone who's not familiar... In Phuket, in Phuket, Thailand, there is a street called <laughs> basically Soy Tiger Muay Thai, which yeah, just means Soy Tiger. Uh, like Tiger Muay Thai Street, because they were them and a small local Thai gym called Dragon Muay Thai were yeah. the only two buildings for like miles. For and yeah. besides maybe some local Thai things, and while we were there, they built Phuket Top Team, yep. and I think since then they built like. A ton of other gyms, a ton it's of restaurants. Exploded. Yeah. There's like CrossFit training. I mean, there's cafes. There's all kinds of different gyms. It's like just wall-to-wall businesses now. Yeah. And I think this is one of those things where when, you know people kind of reminisce about places they travel to that have changed like really quickly. Sometimes people say things have changed, but I'll go back and I'm like, you know, it's not that different. Like, for example, Koh Tao, I went back very recently and it's almost exactly the same. And it's almost crazy that in 10 years, like things, sometimes like things just don't, don't change that much. I think it's just because, you know, island life in the morning is a bit slower. So things kind of change a bit slower. And the second, mm. it was already kind of built up anyways. So there, there just wasn't that much room to, to build more stuff. Yeah, I think, well, there's that old phrase, you know, it's, uh, it's, you're the one who changes, not the place, you know. And I guess in some cases that, that can be true. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I can imagine because if I was still in my, you know, mid 20s. Watching, you know, the Ultimate Fighter, you know, tr- you know, wishing or just daydreaming about being a, an MMA fighter or, or a professional kickboxer, I would go there and I would probably love it. I would probably be like, yeah. "This is the best street <laughs> in the world." Yeah. Well, you know, the last time I was there was 2014, and um, I st- I still loved it, but I did feel the vibe had changed. And one thing, you remember, you remember Tony's restaurant? Yeah, I mean, we we literally ate there every day. <laughs> yeah. It was really I like mean, the only restaurant in the whole area. Yeah, I, I mean, it's still great and everything. Tony's there, but I, I felt like that the energy there kind of changed, the vibe kind of ch- changed there a little bit. I think it's just because they've just been so inundated with so many tourists and they're just kind of burnt out or something. But uh, it's still a wonderful place um, since the last time I was there. I, I kind of would like – I'm thinking about going back there actually for a little bit, do some training. Oh, nice. So what what actually made you decide to to learn Muay Thai or to to go to a fight camp and spar anyways? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I don't know, maybe I told you or mentioned before, you know, I, I grew up doing Taekwondo and I had uh, really awesome Korean masters actually. I grew I started it when I was like ten or eleven and had done it all the way up until I left the United States when I was twenty six. And I also taught it in downtown Chicago, or actually near downtown in, in uh, Lincoln Lincoln Park. So I actually was a Taekwondo instructor as well. So naturally, I was in, interested in martial arts. And I had tried jiu-jitsu uh, in, when I was in university, and it just was not for me. I just, I, I just did not – I don't know. My brain did not compute that way. So I was always more of a striker. And, and boxing and kicking, especially kicking, became a, was very natural to me. So Muay Thai just kind of made sense, and I felt it was kind of a hardcore training that I was really craving at the time. I still kind of crave that hardcore training. So – yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I think that being at a gym where you know professional fighters are training and you yeah. have no responsibilities, you know, you eat there, you sleep there, you right. you just train once or twice a day 
for you know three yeah. hours at a time. It's yeah. a that's a nice feeling. Yeah, and it's that's that's the thing. It's like one week. What I feel is like one like one month training there like equals like a year of training back home. It's like it's it's so intense. Like you get so much done, and your fitness levels just skyrocket. Um, and not only that, but you're you're in a stress free environment. You're surrounded by beautiful nature and like amazing food and smiling people, and it just it just pumps you up to the next level. Yeah, and I think. Thailand is just a lot less strict when it comes to rules as well and safety. Mm, yeah. So you know, <laughs> we're sparring every day, you know, uh, pretty much from day one. While yep. in the U.S., at, at least all the gyms I've been to, they don't spar. Like, right. You know, and it's if they do, it's like you know they're like, okay, yeah, you have to train here for like two years, and then you can lightly spar. Yeah. Once, once a month or once a week or something. In, in they Thailand, you, you spar every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, look at the Thai kids. They do it too. They just throw them in there and start doing it, you know? That's yeah. how you learn. And on one hand, I understand, you know, it's a bit extreme. Like in Thailand, you know, when you see a seven-year-old kid kicking the crap out of another one, you know, elbowing each other in the face, I can see why from the, you know, civilized Western world, we might look at that and think, you know, that's um, a bit too rough, right? Like I wouldn't want right, my right. kid going through that. But at the same time, right. on the other extreme – you know, maybe we're way too soft in the U.S. Where we're so afraid yeah. of people getting hurt, we're so afraid of you know, like lawsuits right. or litigation that There's, we just don't do anything. Yeah, that's 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 a huge kind of culture war we're kind of having right now. I've I've probably spent a hundred hours a month looking into all these things. I've I've kind of gotten away from it because. It, Anyways, but there's there's one I, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt who did a lot of work showing that um, you know children these days are just mollycoddled too much. Like back in the day when you and I grew up, you know we got to run outside and play without parental supervision, and you know we may have had some um, you know confrontations or whatever, but we sorted it out. But nowadays, you know, we, children are always like babied, and uh, you know we have to appeal to a higher authority. We have to bring in the adults to solve all of our problems. So yeah, well actually, so I'm here in Ukraine right now. And I was taking the subway, and I saw this. I mean, I don't know how old they were, maybe eight or ten or something. This, but like this kid on their little um, razor kick kick scooter, yep. riding the metro by themselves. Huh. And I was thinking, like in the U.S., this this doesn't happen anymore. I, right. I don't think like kids are allowed to go to school by themselves or go home by themselves. Yeah. Right, right, right. And it's stupid. I mean, you know, on one hand, it's sad that you know maybe maybe like a few bad things happen once in a while that are really right. bad and shouldn't happen but at the same right. time by like coddling every kid now and saying like okay yeah. like nobody's allowed to, to you know to take the bus anymore until you turn 18 or something it right. doesn't make any sense yeah I, I guess you know it's kind of a balance that that needs to be found but i guess if you go to one extreme or the other it's probably not as good but um i guess the problem also is you know People are not prepared to face the real world when they when they grow up and they're you know we have all these safe spaces all these things that's a whole different conversation but you know life is sometimes hard we need to to toughen up you know yeah and that honestly that's actually one of the, my favorite things about Ukraine is the fact that people are still pretty tough here uh, I I'm, yeah, I, I remember I that. in the um, in the park right across the street from my house they have pull up bars and every time I walk past and I do you know I I do some pull ups and random right. like kids you know like little kids like right. know, eight or ten or something would, would come like walk by they would do some pull-ups some got like some father brought like four kids i think like between i don't know like maybe six years old or something like really small kids wow. and he was like okay and boys and girls two boys two girls and he's like all right we're, we're doing pull-ups and yeah. it's just part of their routine part of their life and like how many americans do you know that can actually even do one pull-up right it's funny funny you mentioned that um that was something I struggled as a as a kid when I was younger, and I got a pull up bar put in, the, in my garage here, and I, I do them every day, and I've gotten so much better at it, and now I feel like okay, that's one thing I've conquered. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, like the example with Ukraine, I mean, they they know what it's like in the real world, so they they're trying to, I guess, toughen up their kids, not molly coddle them so much. Yeah, and I think a good example of like why it doesn't work is I remember growing up. Like I would always, you know, play in the dirt, right? And right. I, I was really bad at washing my hands. I would wash it with water, but just <laughs> like barely, I hardly use soap. And it turns out that that's actually really healthy for you. 
especially as a kid, is right. to kind of have germs sometimes because right, right, right. they've done a study where when kids or anyone uses antibacterial soap, it kills so much of the good and bad bacteria mm. that their immune system just sucks. Right. Yeah, I guess I guess really science they're finding that, that we're like a living biome. You know, we're f- filled with bacteria and viruses and fungi and all this kind of stuff. But it's, you know, there's got to be a, a balance and, you know, you, you kill off too much bacteria, good and bad, and there's going to be some kind of imbalance coming in. Um, that's just from the, the, the little research I've done. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's, things are really progressing and uh, knowledge is really growing. And like you said, like, we, we need to have some of that dirt sometimes. We need to get dirty. <laughs> well, we definitely got dirty at like the Muay Thai mats just Oh yeah, being sweaty and just like I mean, they probably should clean it a little bit better than they do. But at the same time, yeah, what, we got lucky. What was that? What was that one skin skin infection that we were, were always afraid of? We had to use that yeah. detol soap. We had to like cover our bodies with that soap. What it, was that? It was either ringworm or staff. staff. Yes, yeah, staff. That was a, that was the one. Yeah, I remember. I remember just like having that that detol like that 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 soap, you know, that antibacterial soap, and just like scrubbing my body with that, like after every session, you know. Yeah, we probably should just scrub the mats instead, but it's okay. It worked out. Okay, so how did we go from how how did how did you go from training Muay Thai and living at this camp to your next step? Which was it teaching teaching English in uh, well, Korea? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. So actually, let's backtrack. I I went to Korea two years before that. I, I had already taught for two years in Korea, and then I I met you in in Thailand at the Muay Thai camp and okay. trained there. And then I went back to Korea and lived there for like another five years. Yeah. And it, it made like three more trips back to Thailand to do training. Okay, nice. So, okay. So for, for anyone who hasn't seen the episode covered, Josh isn't Korean. No. Yeah. I, was born, I was born in the United States. Uh, I guess my, 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 my grandparents are, you know, from uh, European stock, as you might say. Okay. So I think now you look a little bit different because you have the beard. But when I met you, yeah. you were basically like pale – um, lanky white dude. Yeah, I guess it's a good good description. Uh, so what? what some, but what what made you like feel so fascinated with Korea? Like, what brought you there? Ah, uh, well, like I mentioned before, I started doing taekwondo when I was like eleven years old, and uh, my my Korean the, the Korean master I had was like he was like freaking grandmaster. He was like legit hardcore, and just I was just so blown away and impressed by. By him, and I, I had another master uh, who's who's also phenomenal. His name is uh, Master Sungmin Park. I believe he went down to Texas, and uh, both those two masters made a huge impact on my life, and just you know, in a way, shared their culture with me. And just I was just always fascinated with with Koreans and Korean culture. I I don't know why, just something that made an impression on me when I was very young. And once the I realized, like, oh, after you know, I graduate university, I could go teach in Korea, and I'm like. That makes perfect sense. I need to do that. And also, when I was younger, when I was like 16, I saw that movie The Beach with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah. And I, I knew. I'm like, I, need, I have to go to Thailand. Like, this is my life's mission. I need to go there. I need to go to the beaches. I need to eat the Thai food. And I had already been eating all that food and been into Thai culture as well before, before I went. And so Korea was a great way to, like, kill two birds with one stone. You know, I could go to Korea to teach and then go to Thailand or wherever else in Asia I wanted to go. Oh, that's cool. By the way, if if you haven't seen it on Netflix, there's a new uh, series called Street Food, and the first episode is about street food in Thailand and Bangkok, and it's so good. That sounds awesome. And it makes food me miss. Point. It makes me miss uh, Thai food so much. I miss it every day, man. I I can't wait to go back. So okay, so I guess next question before we get into the business stuff is wh- where are you now? Are you back in Chicago? Uh, well, yeah, I'm in a suburb of Chicago, but an hour and a half west of Chicago. So l- let me just give a little backstory. So I left Korea in 2015, you know, just, just through a lot of realizations that, yeah, I'm, I'm done teaching. I'm done being an ESL teacher in Korea. Uh, the job market there has changed a lot, and it's just not something I want to do for the rest of my life. And so um, I, I came back to the uh, United States. I was also kind of burned out with the air pollution there. The air pollution has gotten really bad. And just want to take a break from the, the drinking. I mean, the it is – a lot of people don't realize this, but Seoul is probably like top five best nightlife in the entire world um, easily. Yeah, I've heard uh, that. And I've also heard that it's in, impossible to escape from. If you're living, it, it yeah, if you're living there, you have to drink. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's something that you, you can't wrap your head around until you actually go there and get immersed 
in immersed in the you know expat culture and the Korean culture, it's like a double double whammy, and it's just it's well Korea. What is it? They're the, they're the number one consumers of hard liquor in the world, which is soju, of course. But yeah, they're like they beat out the Russians. They beat out everybody. It's just so ingrained into the culture. Like, and that's how you actually can move up in their society is by being social and by drinking and showing that you're like a team player. So yeah, I just kind of got. You know, just I knew I was done teaching English and was just kind of you know burned out. Needed a time to uh, recharge and refresh, so came back and have been in my parents' basement for like the past three and a half years, I guess. Wow. Yep. Okay. So before we get to that part, do you have any regrets of spending that much time in Korea, or was it more like <laughs> mm-hmm. like you loved it, but then it was just enough? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So yeah, I I I really loved it, and the really amazing thing is like the friendships that I made there. And just also the opportunity to go to Thailand and make friends. I mean, the friendships that I've I've made so many friends. I've made more friends than I know what to do with. And like these are friends for a lifetime. And that experience is just just priceless, right? And then just being able to learn the language, you know, learning to speak Korean is another priceless, you know, um, benefit and uh, an amazing experience. And just you know, seeing the world, th- you know, uh, getting a broader perspective and. All those things, but yeah, I feel like I stayed there for a few more years too long. I felt like probably five years would have been enough. Um, so that's that's one thing I, re- I regret. I probably should have left that at five years and probably gone to Thailand and started doing drop shipping. <laughs> you know. Well, so that's actually a funny thing that you mentioned because I think the same thing happens to a lot of people where where they find something different and really unique and really cool that they mm-hmm. get really excited about, mm. but then it the passion kind of dies and they start yeah. not loving it, but they feel kind of stuck because they're like, well, my yes. old life wasn't what I, what did it make me happy? This new life seemed like it made me happy, but if this doesn't make me happy, then I'm really stuck. And right. I felt kind of the same th- way with scuba diving. You know, I, re- I loved it so much when I first started and I did it for, you know, four, maybe five years. And I'm lucky that I stopped. You know, right. Because if if I went if I did it for one more year, I probably would have hated it. I, I probably right. would hate it so much that I wouldn't want to even do it for fun anymore. And right. probably the same with Muay Thai too. I think after you know doing it for I don't know how many years, I just you know got tired of living in these you know crappy gyms huts. in these <laughs> <Yeah>. huts. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. waking up to train every day, always being you know bruised and injured. Right. But yeah. I I really loved the time that I had done it. Oh yeah, I I totally feel feel you on that one, uh, and that's that's how I feel about Korea and with many things. But yeah, I think you know we evolve and change and grow, and I think that's one of the one of the reasons why we need to be rooted in our I guess our true selves in a way, and to really know what's going on inside, and to know when it's time to make a change, and to move on or cut out some bad habits and develop better ones, and and to go to the next level. Yeah, I mean. I, I definitely agree. And I think that, you know, maybe like the next level is just normal because we're just constantly right. evolving, you know, that it's not it's not a bad thing that we, you know, spent five years in Korea. We spent five years right. scuba diving. Right. Those are memories that I, I really don't think we're going to regret this when we're 90 no. in, our, in our deathbed. We're going to be like, oh, that was a good five years. Absolutely. One thing I, I have noticed, though, I, actually, I forgot I wanted to say this, was – um I have seen this trend in Korea, and I'm sure it's true in like Japan, maybe Thailand, or maybe other countries. Like expats go there, like you said, they may have had an, a passion for the culture or whatever they they like the lifestyle, and then all of a sudden, ten, twelve years goes by, and they're trapped, and they haven't developed any new skills, and they're just kind of stuck in a cycle of drinking and socializing and and whatever, or it, and they're just kind of trapped there, and they're they get kind of miserable. So. Yeah, you know, like, and, and it's sad because because we see this and we hear about it in every expat circle, not just in Thailand, yeah. not just in Korea, but literally around the world. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with they kind of get I don't know. I think when you first go somewhere, everything's new and exciting. You don't really understand right. the, the language or culture, so right. you kind of forgive it and you think it's fun and enduring. But then after you know five years, I think that's kind yep. of the magic that's, number. That's kind of the yep. You kind of feel like you like you start seeing the the downsides to it, and you're like, oh man, yeah. Like, and I remember, so my first my first book I wrote, Twelve Weeks in Thailand: The Good Life on the Cheap, was about escaping the U.S., finding scuba diving and Muay Thai, and living cheaply in Thailand, and how amazing it was. But then my second book, Life Changes Quick, was about seeing that I had built myself another prison where 
right. I didn't want to be that old British guy, you know, yeah. teaching scuba diving, and right. living, you know, married to a Thai wife with kids, and just being trapped, and you know, being and, like, crap, this is it. And just going to the bar and drinking tons of singhas like every night to to dull the pain. Yeah, and then like complaining, complaining. talking crap on uh, Facebook all day. Right, right, complaining about Thailand or complaining about whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. I think we've kind of discovered the kind of magic loop is do do things for five years or until you, you know right. you start complaining more than you start enjoying and then just go somewhere else. And having yep. the freedom, I, I think that's the kind of key point. And this is the difference between the shoes that we're in, also entrepreneurs and other digital nomads, is we have choice. We can move right. our jobs, we can move our businesses, we can move ourselves while yep. a lot of people – who traditionally, you know, either have a job somewhere, um, maybe they work for a U.S. company in Korea or somewhere else, or they're teaching there. They, they kind of feel stuck, or they don't have the money to move. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I I, I had a really good chat with an Israeli um, student that I'm I'm helping prepare for job interviews. I also do teaching on the side. I teach on italki.com. You can make your own teacher profile and. You set your own rates and, and, and schedule and teach. And so he's applying for this big job. And we were talking about how, um, you know, in the old days, like, you know, our parents or grandparents, you got a job and that was it. Like 30 years or whatever it was, 35 years, you worked there and then you retired and you're done. But now with the technology and with the Internet and the, the globalization of everything, is, we have become so interconnected. And, the, you know, like people are working jobs only four or five years and then they, they, they shift and everything is in a big flux and upheaval right now. And I think like you, especially, I think, you you know, you're, you're like on the cutting edge where, you know, creating an, an online business, uh, being an entrepreneur uh, and just being open to the fact that there's so much work to do online, even just as a freelancer, like working up work.com or as an English teacher online, like, you know, I have all these students that, that, that I, that I teach you know, as just a freelance teacher, um, you know, in, in addition to doing drop shipping and, and that. So I think it's important, like you have to have an open mind and be willing to change and grow and to, you know, may, maybe take a big leap, take a big risk, you know, and try something like this. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, even things like the teaching English online, like some of them pay really good. Like what, yeah. do, you, what do you earn on italki? Uh, so I just set my rate at $16 an hour um, for general conversation classes and then i do some ielts preparation which is like i think i set it to twenty dollars an hour what, what is uh, ielts oh i'm sorry that's that's the international english language testing system <laughs> and uh yeah I'm sure, no, I'm sure nobody listened to this new with that man well now but this is a good tip because ielts is a booming booming industry so basically what ielts is is like so if you're if you're from the philippines and you want to go work in the united states or Australia, you're going to have to take an IELTS test. It's just they're testing your listening, your reading, your writing, and your speaking skills. And then you get an IELTS score. And if you get an IELTS score of, say, of a seven, then you can you know, be eligible to work or study in those countries. So all these countries are now kind of shifting to this IELTS thing. And um, it's, it's a big lucrative business these days. Like there's a lot of IELTS teachers charging like 40, 50 bucks an hour. Um, I was actually looking t- into getting becoming an official IELTS examiner just so I could have the fact that, you know, I'm an examiner and start charging $50 an hour for these kinds of lessons. Wow, that's cool. And is that allowed if you're an examiner to also be a tutor? No, you cannot. But I mean, you can, you can get their certificate, you can go through the examiner training to be an IELTS examiner and you don't have to do that forever, right? You can. Oh, you can say like, like, it's basically like saying like, I'm a former uh, IRS yes. agent now. Yes, m- exactly. I do taxes. Okay. Right. You you would say I'm a former IELTS examiner. Now I do tutoring. I know the insides and outs of the IELTS system. You know, hire me as your tutor. Forty, fifty bucks an hour. That is genius. Yep. That is a really smart move. Mm-hmm. So that's there. There's so many things. There's so many options. But the the English teaching online is really growing a lot. I mean, it's it's really growing. And I also teach for a Korean company as well. So the Korean company gives me more stable teaching hours, and then the italki is what I do, just kind of in the spare time, uh, in my spare hours. And uh, it's it's so cool because I a lot of times I go over time with the classes because I'm talking to so many interesting people from Brazil or from you know all over Asia or all over Europe, like French. I have some French students and I have Russian students, and 
you know, Koreans and, and Chinese and all these people that you get to interact with. And like some of them have some really interesting business ideas or they're doing, they have interesting cool lives. So it's, yeah, it's really great. Yeah. And I like that. It's not that you're teaching them like a curriculum. It's really, you're just chatting right. with them but, and it could be about anything, right? Well, yeah. So it's kind of up to you and kind of what they want. So actually some students, they do want more structured approach. So I actually have special, you know, ESL textbooks that we go through. Um, other students, like they're doing job interview preparation. So we focus on that. Uh, and then other students just want to do free talking and you give them, you know, uh, feedback on their grammar. You correct their grammar mistakes and you teach them idioms. Like I do that with, with a lot of students is, is explain and teach them idioms to use in conversations. It's really helpful. So it, it's you try to make it a student centered approach. So whatever the student wants, like that's what you're going to custom tailor to. So an idiom for anyone who hasn't heard the word is like an expression that's that, that we use in the U.S. or in Canada that right. other people don't, don't necessarily like, use, right? Right. Kill, kill two birds with one stone, right? So, you know, to, to, to an ESL learner maybe in, you know, Russia, they might not know what it means at first. And then you just explain it to them and then, oh, and then they can use it the next time. One of the hardest things about learning Russian is I thought that once I can – like. I was able to read um, like the basics of Russian and, and know the words for like chicken or you know fish or beef uh, that I can uh. at least read menus. But then mm-hmm. I would look at menus now and I'm like, is this like what language is this? And, uh. and people would explain they're like, okay, yeah, it's Russian, but the the names of all the dishes are like kind of funny or like just kind of random cool. things that have nothing to do with what's in the dish. They'll you know they'll call it like. Um, so it's calling it like you know fish of the day. They'll they'll call it like you know sea like I don't know like <laughs> some, like like Poseidon's delight or something. <laughs> <laughs> so they're they're making yeah they're using their own little expressions and and, and making up uh, like special terms for the for the food that doesn't make sense to you because you, you you're not Russian right yeah. So I, I understand the stress and I understand why people you know pay money for tutors because as a native English speaker. It was so easy for me to go on these different apps and sites um, to to find people who want to learn English and you know, but speak Russian natively. And right. I feel bad because like some of them have been studying English for like five years, and they said that mm. I'm the first person they've ever spoken to. Like that wow. was a native English speaker. Yeah, I, I'd imagine there's not a lot of native English speakers in Ukraine, right? Yeah. And or like in, you know, Siberia or some like small Siberia. village in Russia, you know, like these right, people right. I meet online, it's, yeah, it, it's like for them, it's, it's like a whole new world. Yeah, it's, that's, it, that's what it is. It's like a lot of them, they just want to talk to a native English speaker. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. Um, it's, yeah. they just, they, they don't, they never had that opportunity, but now with technology, now it's there, it's available. Yeah, and with growing economies like China, or you know, or places like Korea, where people ha- actually have money to pay sixteen dollars yes. an hour or twenty bucks an hour, yep. Yep. It, it makes absolute you know absolute sense. Oh yeah, they they really need it. I mean, uh, you know, I I teach a lot of like Korean, you know, business people and executives, and like they're going on business trips, they're going to England, they're going to America. They need to know this stuff. They need to practice. So yeah, there, yeah, there's. A, Korea, actually, yeah, Korea, I think, is number one in, for demand for, for English tutoring and English language. Um, yeah, because you know, even though it's expensive, they know that the, the ROI for them, the return on investment is huge. If they can oh, yeah. learn how to speak English you know, well or at least be able to yes. communicate, they can double or triple their salaries through promotions. Ye- yes, and, and, and really – so yet one thing about Korea is, as you know, it's a very small country, right? High population density. There's so much competition for for jobs in general, and if you want to work for Samsung or one of the, one of the big conglomerates, you know, Samsung, LG, Hyundai, like that's just a requirement. Is you have to have a high level of English proficiency just to go into those companies. So, yeah. so it makes sense. You know, they yeah. might spend a couple hundred bucks a month, you know, learning yes. English, but then they might make a couple thousand bucks a month more eventually. Yes, eventually. Yeah, I like I like it. Okay, so. We went from Taekwondo teacher, English teacher in Korea, <laughs> yep. uh, doing Muay Thai in Thailand, going yep. back to teach English online. And then yep. how did you get into dropshipping? 
Great, great, uh, great question. So, you know, I, as you know, I, I've, I've been following your blog and following you since we met in Thailand, basically. And uh, I, st- you know, as soon as you started your dropship journey, I was like, boom, th- this is what I have to do. It just made total sense to me. And for me, it was kind of like, yeah, this is my plan for, for after I'm done teaching English in Korea. Um, okay. And even I, I kind of wanted to start it, start it while I was in Korea, but it, it just working full time and just being so busy with my life there, I just couldn't do it. And so I came back to the United States and I'm like, okay, you know, it's time for me to do drop shipping. Okay. And, so um, I started in 2013 when I was in Thailand. When did you start it? 2016, summer 2016. Wow. So you kind of had in the back of your mind for those three years. Yes. But then you were still, you know, teaching full time in Korea and probably yes. waking up with hangovers and drinking too yes. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Waking up with hangovers and being like, oh, I need to get out of this. I need to I need to move forward with my life. Actually, it it even goes further back. When I was 19, I read or 1920, I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert T. Kiyosaki. And I knew it was like, okay, yeah, business. This makes sense. I need to do business, you know, when when I get older. It was kind of something in the back of my mind anyway. And draft shipping that business model just made perfect sense to me once I, once I learned it from you. Okay, that makes sense. So you waited three years, but then you moved back to the U.S., back, yes. in, back with your parents in their basement. Yes. <laughs> and you were like I, – I, I think I actually remember getting a message from you saying like, hey, yeah. you know, I'm going to sign up. Can, you, can I use your link or something? Right, right. Yep. Yeah. I remember – I remember. yeah, I remember – I think I just sent, sent, sent you a message saying – Hey man, like I'm gonna, you know, do the drop shipping course. You know, I used your link or something like that. Yeah, it was back in 2016. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And then, and then, then what? What happened? Uh, okay, yeah, that's that's an interesting journey. So, okay, so you know, I I got the course and I dived into it and I started going through it and, uh, you know, so the first difficult thing is, you know, building a Shopify store, right? You know, somebody who doesn't have any computer skills or, you know, any of the technical kind of stuff or no, somebody who's never had that kind of experience, it's kind of, you know, it's hard at first. So, you know, I went through this, the course, I built my Shopify store, you know, I got the logo design and I, I got a concept, I, I picked a niche and like, you know, I'm really brushing over those things, but, you know, they they were really kind of, you know, intense and, and hard and, you know, I got through all that. So I got my store built up and then it came to the point of, okay, got to contact suppliers now. And that's where I got stuck, and a lot of a lot of think students get stuck at that point. Yeah, did you get stuck for like a legitimate reason, or were you just afraid to call suppliers? Uh, well, well, yeah. So I got stuck because it, you know at this point I was way out of my comfort zone, right? And uh, I was out of my comfort zone and just started procrastinating it because uh, you know I, I'm in totally I was in totally uncharted territory. Never had done anything like this in my entire life, and I think that's kind of beautiful one of the beautiful things about entrepreneurship is that it pushes you outside of your comfort zone right and it's, it's good for you it helps you grow as a person and so i never done anything like this entire life and i think i sat for at least a couple of months and then finally wow. i just worked out. yeah it took me a couple wow. of months i think but you know what it's cool that you eventually got back into it because i bet you there's so many people who get who just never even make that first call exactly and yep. th- it's a good thing for the rest of the people because it weeds out people who are not serious. You know, right. I, I guarantee like 90% of people without even trying, you know, without really giving it a shot, they're like, uh, you know, it's not going to work because yes. you know, X, Y, Z, or it's not gonna work for me because of X, Y, Z, or, right. Oh, I'm going to try this other thing. Cause it seems easier, you know, or, yep. Oh, why don't I just sell from AliExpress? I don't, I don't have to talk to anybody. Ugh. And I think this is why Anton's method is still working so well today in 2019 is because there's that barrier to entry, which isn't yes. even a legitimate barrier to entry. It's, it's really just no. psychological. It's just yes. comfort zone. A- absolutely. And that was one thing too that, that kind of would freak me out because when I learned the system, I'm like, oh my God, like everybody's going to be doing this. Like, you know, there's just a nice formula to follow and everybody's going to do, there's too much competition, right? That's a, that, that kind of negative self you know, self-doubt thing coming in, but you're right. Like people get stuck and they, like you said, it weeds out a lot of people. So there, there really are a lot of opportunities. It really is like legit and it really, it does work like magic in a sense, you know, if you get everything working right. Yeah. I mean, it's not that it's magic. It's just like, it's just a, a formula that it, it just works, you know, like it's, it's been tested. It works. Right. And 
I think the high price point for the course and then needing to you know actually pick up the phone and talk to people and, and be a real business as opposed yes. to just being like some website where you just like click stuff and you send emails. I think that keeps a lot of people out. Yes, it. I mean, this is this is not effing around here. You know, you are a real business. Like it's, uh, you know, getting an LLC and all those things. Like you're learning business skills, and you, yeah, it's it is it gets pretty serious. Yeah, and I think the nice thing about like spending that that money joining Anton's course is, aside from like nothing else, like. You have that commitment. You're like, crap! I dropped, you know, a thousand dollars. I dropped two thousand dollars. That's yeah. That's what. That's what made me keep going. Is like, oh, I spent all this money. Like, I gotta finish it. You know, I gotta go to the end and and keep pushing this uncharted ter- territory. Yeah, but imagine if you had just like read some article or like watched some YouTube video on how to do it, or spent like ten dollars on a course. You'd probably be like, ah, it's not for me. Like, let me try something else. But I know for a fact, if, like whenever I spend over a thousand dollars on something, I'm gonna do it. I'm like, yeah, I, I feel so stupid if I don't at least try. Yeah, exactly. That that was the other thing too. Is like, you know, I I would feel like such a pile of crap if I didn't, you know, finish it. And I think that's one of one of the that's the values that I learned with with doing martial arts is to push hard, to keep going. And you know, that's one thing with martial arts is you're always pushed out of your comfort zone, or you should be. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and the cool thing about sparring, I think, is it really forces you to shut up and and you know test yourself because oh, yes. you can't always you know walk you know like talk yourself out of it. You can't like have an excuse because you're gonna get hit in the face. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. That and that, that I think that's something that men need in general. That's that's that we had a lot in the past, but it's so lacking nowadays because everything's so easy is to actually have a challenge to actually fight for something, you know, to there, you see like all kinds of people, like maybe like Elliot Hulse or different people doing like these like challenging, you know, men activities where, you know, they might do some crazy exercises or they do fasting or something. And it's just to have that challenge as a man to test your might. And that's that's what martial arts is is for me, and, yeah, and also doing business. Definitely, and you know, I think it's especially important for for men to go through. You know, when we kind of go, you know, when we turn eighteen, sixteen, or eighteen, and we have to be a man. Right. But I think it's important right. for everyone to go through. It's just like yeah. some kind of hardship, some kind of challenge where right. it's, not, too. it's not it's not easy. Like nobody's gonna give you a second place. You know. You know, tenth place trophy, <laughs> like, right? Participation trophy. Yeah, I, like it, it's something that like people are like look, you, like you didn't train hard. You know, you screwed up. You can either, you know, I'm not gonna just, I'm not gonna pat you on the back for coming in tenth place because I know you could have done better. So you can right. either just admit to it, and that's a lesson in, in itself. Just like, yeah, yes. you know, I messed up. Or right. you can redeem yourself and say, okay, you know what, I messed up, but I'm gonna train hard, and then I'm gonna do it again. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's such a valuable lesson to learn. I mean, and to not just to learn, but to keep doing it, you know, because we sometimes get lazy. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree. And I, and I think it's it's funny that maybe one of the reasons why we were able to do well business wise is because we had struggled, you know, and gone through mm-hmm. these challenges, you know, yes. uh, getting out of our comfort zone, even traveling and moving to a different country, right? And then doing Muay Thai and sparring, and you know, just, yes, just like getting out of our comfort zone exactly yeah exactly yeah i think it's uh, all of those things kind of work together maybe as a synergy or something to uh you know kind of help push you to the next level you know when it comes to challenging things and not to say that somebody just staying home in america who didn't do those things couldn't do it of course there's many talented people here too or or whatever country you're from can do it but uh but yeah they, they, those all those things that you mentioned definitely really help yeah, sure. I, I agree. So you finally kind of worked up the balls to, to call a supplier. Then what happened? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So finally, I worked up the balls to do it. I manned up. Drank and... some soju. <laughs> yeah. No. Just drank some pure water, basically. Maybe, maybe the soju uh, would have helped. Maybe that's what that, that was the key probably, that was missing. That's probably. But no, I just I called and it was so stupid easy, and I felt like such an idiot that I hadn't done it <laughs> early. So do you remember what I, the first conversation was like? Yeah, so basically I said, you know, oh hi, you know, I am Josh from xyz.com website, you know, um, you know, we're we're expanding our product line and we really re- be interested in having, you know, featuring your products on our website. They're like, "Okay, what's the address?" I'm like, oh, "Okay, here it is, blah blah blah." And then they looked at it, they're like, "Oh, that's pretty good." 
yeah, yeah, we'll just send you over the the package. The what is it? The, the you know all our map prices and all our poli- you know our map policies, and we'll we'll send you over the, the all the spreadsheets and you know, just upload it as soon as you can. I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> You're like, oh. so I mean. What, what, yeah, what, like, what was I waiting for four months to do? Yeah, like, why was I waiting? This is so stupid and easy. Like, they just, you know, because when, when you get outside your comfort zone, like, you know, you, you get all this self, this negative self-talk, like, oh, they're going to ask me, like, all these technical questions about, like, profit and, like, you know, margins and all this stuff. And no, it was just basically they just wanted to see that your site looked halfway legit. Yeah, and, and this uh, is... And, and I think a lot of the big mistakes that people make, especially when they haven't invested time or money into it, is they half ass it. Like I've met right. so many people who claim they tried dropshipping and it failed for the, you know it didn't work for them. And then I right. I asked what their you know their domain name was, and they're like, oh, I, I didn't buy one. I, it's it's just mm-hmm. you know like X Y Z at shop you know dot Shopify what <laughs> trial <laughs> dot com or something. No. And then I go to it, and there's like a password. Like, oh yeah, you have to put in the password. It's this, and I'm like, what? come on, man. Like, are you serious? Right, right, right. You got to make it look legit. Yeah, and this is what's nice about Anton's course is it like it's a step by step process where he tells you like, okay, this is why you have to make your store look good and spend the time right. building it up before you call a supplier. This is why you have to call and not just email them. This is what you yeah. say when you're on the phone. You know, this is what like, and I think those are the things that people who haven't run a business before they don't really think about. They're just like, well, I don't want to invest any time or money into it's, something if i know i'm not gonna it, they're not gonna approve me so let me just spend as little energy as possible while i'm on the free no. trial of shopify no. and let me call them and you know and then if they say no then i know this doesn't work and it i should just work. do something else yeah maybe what is that like confirmation bias or something yeah. something like that but yeah yeah i mean you, you you have to be a hustler and even anton in his course said okay guys this is gonna be hard right he didn't you know the sense that I got was he didn't try to sugarcoat. He's like, yeah, this is this your legit business. You know, this is not messing around. This is hard. This is challenging. You have to put in the work. And the one thing he always stressed was like, you know, follow the course. Just follow the course. You know, it's going to be hard, but just follow it. But it's hard at first if you've never done anything like this. But once you do it and go through it, then it's like, oh, okay, like I can replicate this again. You know, I, you know, I can do it again. And anything in in life that's wonderful and amazing is going to be hard anyway so you you know you have to struggle for it but in the end i mean the reward just is just so sweet you know okay so so what happened so you got your first supplier and then how long did it take you from that point to make your first sale okay so yeah i got my first supplier then i got a bunch of other suppliers and i got things rolling and uh let's see i the store opened for sale in like february of 2017 and then honestly, it was like within like a week or something, within a a, a week or two. Okay. Um, and I and I, yeah, I just I got like three sales like off the bat. I was like, huh? I was like, wow, like this really works. You know. I, I think I almost remember you sending me a message or something saying like like hey like. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, I got my first. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did. I, I remember yeah, that. I, I, I like, love oh, those messages. Like, Thank you. Like, yeah. Right. Right. And I and but then I I always say ahead. like oh like let me know when you get your second one and I think you had responded something like oh I, I already did let me see if I can pull yeah, this up yeah. again this is it's, it's always kind of fun to look back yeah but yeah I think I think I got a couple more or something like that and it just kind of became like commonplace <laughs> yeah it's funny I, I don't know I, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a look for it but it's funny that oh look here it is um it was March fifteenth two thousand seventeen. Right. I just got my first sale, by the way. Thanks for showing me the way. And then before I even saw it or had to, uh, time to respond, you wrote, holy shit, bro. It just made a second sale, not even 24 <laughs> hours apart. Right, right, right. Yep, yeah, I remember that. Yep. Oh, I love it. Cool, man. So, and yeah, and then I and then I think we yeah we, we talked a little bit about like what's happening in Ukraine and you going to Thailand. But then right. I think fa- like what – so what happened? Like how, how long did it take for you to start earning like real money from it? Yes, to be to – be, yes. So – uh, that, that didn't happen until that summer or late summer, I think around September or early October. And that's, that's the part where I have to mention where I partnered up with somebody. Okay. So, because I mean, it, I was not very good at doing Google AdWords. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I partnered with somebody who had, 
who was very good at it. And we just took this thing to the next level. And he, so he, he did like, he did so much with Google ads and he really helped uh, just kind of do some tweaks with the web design. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I partnered with somebody. Well, did, how, did, mean, how did you meet this guy? Oh, uh, well, he was just another member in the, in the DSL group. Okay. And was he so doing just, pretty good with his stores? Um, I think at the time he, he had had some success before, but he was taking a break or something. Okay. But I, I knew that he was, he was really good with uh, the marketing aspect. Oh, nice. So how, how much were you doing in sales per month before you teamed up with them? Um, I think I was doing maybe like five grand a month in sales per month. And, and what was that in profit? Uh, I, I, I think at that point it wasn't, I was maybe barely even breaking even. You wow. Know, was, okay. Yeah. So, so probably spending too much on ads. Yes. Like not exactly. having that much um, revenue in the first place. Right. Okay. And, and then you brought him on board and then what happened? Right. So it brought him on board and literally like that next month ads shot up by like, I don't, I mean, I mean, uh, revenue shot up by like, like, I don't know, 500%, you know? Wow. And then, uh, okay. so, and then the following month after that, like we were like already at 30 grand a month in sales revenue. That's crazy. And, and then was that was, already like profit I'm, was like 12% or something like that, you know? Okay, nice. And that's like, I'm, I'm assuming that's like net profit after your ad spend, yes, like the shipping spend, rates, all yes, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Cause exactly. Because what kind of margins was your suppliers giving you? So with the suppliers, we were getting anywhere from like twenty to thirty percent. Okay. Um, and nice. but yeah, like you said, you, there's you know there's expenses. You got to pay your Facebook ad fee, your Google ad fee. You got to pay different fees, uh, and it all adds up. So yeah, after, after all, all stuff. Okay. posting. So it was like I think around twelve percent was just our our average profit margin. Okay, nice. So, but on thirty grand, you know that's like what yeah. three thousand six hundred a month yeah. in net profit. That's good. Yeah, it was, and I mean it was. And that's that's kind of why I said it's like almost magical in a sense because you know when you've struggled for a long time and you struggle 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 and then boom everything clicks into place and all of a sudden you start seeing thirty grand a month on a regular basis you're like wow it just kind of feels that way. Please tell me that one of you was getting a credit card reward reward miles for that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 We, I did that. I had to chase set fire prefer. Oh, nice. Yep. <laughs> And it was nice, like they they increased my limit to like twenty grand, you know, because sometimes you know you're spending like thousands and thousands of dollars on there, so they gave me a nice limit. And uh, yeah, so we 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 split those rewards. Okay, and, so did uh, you just get cash for it, or did you use it to travel? Uh, so cash, and then also I I also booked the ticket to Miami last uh, what was it last September I believe. Okay. Oh, cool. I had like a one week vacation. Okay, nice. Okay. Uh, so you guys are raking in the dough, thirty k a month. Uh, yep. And then what happened? So yeah, we 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 kept ticking along, and uh, yeah, like some months we even did I think forty k. We got up to forty k. Um, and and really, you know, that's some months, you know, because we had you know returned orders or canceled orders. Like I think the revenue might have been higher even than forty k a month. Oh, okay. but um, yeah. but yeah, like and you know, like. And after Christmas, you know, sales went down a little bit, you know, sometimes down to 20 K a month, but still it was, it was consistent profit and consistent, you know, paycheck in your pocket. Yeah, um, nice. and it, what the cool thing was I had a little bit of debt. I think I had like, I don't know, seven grand of debt and that just got psh, wiped out, you know, paid all that off really easily. <laughs> what was, was that from, uh, all the drinking in Seoul? <laughs> just travels, drinking travels. Um, you know, I think I, Went to Thailand. I think I've been there like seven times and going to different places, Hong Kong. Well, I think a lot of that, actually a lot of that was just maybe from staying in Thailand too long, like four or five months, you know, in my 20s, wasn't watching finances so much, so well. Wow. But, um, and that was credit card debt. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's, it's good that you paid that off because that all like, paid off. racks up on you quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was that was all done and over with. Uh, so... Uh, I mean, yeah, it's 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 like a journey. It's a journey of you know self improvement, uh, pushing outside your comfort zone, and and just uh, you know like two you know two heads are better than one. You know that, that's one thing my grandfather always told me when I was young. He said it's not what you know, it's who you know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of always been an ethos in my life. Is like make as many friends as possible. Just because I'm a friendly person, I like making friends, but um, at the same time, like you never know what opportunities might come along, and yeah. you might work with these people and make a company together and be yeah. rich. Or, and and you did know? you meet him in person? Like, was he in Chicago or how, how, 
No, just just through chatting through the through the group, you know. That's cool. I, I think that's what's so cool about being in a in a paid community, or or, or I guess it's right. it's technically free for members, but people paid a lot of money to join this course, and then they get access. So it's not just you know bums off the street asking stupid questions. Right. It's people who you know they committed, they spent money, they spent time, they learned the basics, and now when they're asking questions. They're on this kind of same wavelength or the same, uh, right. you know, place as you. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say before when when you're talking about people said, "Oh, I tried it didn't work." It's like, well, did you connect with anybody? Did you and like, did you get plugged into the community? You know, because uh, yeah, the community not, not really like great. Reddit or like some public forum with a right. bunch of trolls, but like an actual community of people who are doing it. Right, and I think I think th- there's like a barrier because. It, it, when I first started this, you almost have this idea in your head like, oh, like this is like kind of impossible dream thing that only like the really best people can do. And like it's almost like just seems too good to be true at first. But then like once you get into it and then you realize what well, this is just like everyday life for thousands of these people who are doing the same thing. Like yeah. it's it, it becomes like your everyday life where you're running a business and there's customers calling you and you're doing emails and – I mean, of course, I don't want to take it for granted, but it comes to a point where it, it's like, this is just normal everyday life. This is what I do. I, I have an e-commerce store and I run it with my partner. We also had an employee too, um, Roselle. She she did a great job. She We, we got we got her from the, what is it, online PH jobs, I think. Okay, cool. And so, so, like a so VA. And she was doing, like, what, she what was she doing for you? She was doing like um, inventory updates and product uploads. So Oh, cool. And how much did you have to pay her per hour? I don't even – my partner took care of that because they were kind of in the same time zone. He he, he actually lives in uh, in, in Thailand as well. So oh, he cool. would – he and she was in the Philippines. And I, have, you, I don't, have you guys met yet? No, we haven't. But see, that's the thing. Like you and I are having a nice Skype conversation right now. Him and I spent hours and hours and hours talking on Skype, building a really great relationship. I, I, I really want to meet him. I think we might be able to meet uh, this summer. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, so he's coming. He's coming. Yeah, he's he, he's he's going to be traveling this summer. So I think I'll be able to meet him. It'd be really awesome to meet him in person. But I already feel like I've already met him because of the relationship we've we've built. You know, doing this together and just communicating on Skype. Yeah, I I, I think that's cool. Like it's so funny to be able to, to you know run a you know a six figure <laughs> business with someone yeah. who you met online that you've never met I in know. person. I know. Isn't it isn't it crazy? That that's why it's like magical in a sense. It's like it just. Like a hundred years ago, people would have never have imagined something like this. It's just mind blowing in a way. Yeah, that's it's crazy. I, I I like it. Okay, so you guys ran this business. You guys yep. were you know raking in the cash, and then yep. and then what happened? So okay, so we we really took it to the next level, like fall of two thousand seventeen, and then we ran it all the way till summer of two thousand eighteen, and the fall of two thousand eighteen. Uh, and then we both decided like, okay, I think it's time to cash out. Um, so for, for a variety of different reasons, one reason is I need to get out of this basement of 37, <laughs> yeah. of 37. I've already lived like, you know, almost a decade of my life overseas. Uh, and I mean, I mean, I love my parents and I love the opportunity to be in here, but, uh, you know, my, my, my sweatpants, wearing sweatpants every day, every day, those days are over. <laughs> Um, it's time to, to get out and, um, you know, do, do the next adventure overseas and, and just, I'm going to, you know, looking to stay in Asia permanently now. Oh, cool. Yeah. You don't want to become the next George Costanza living, yeah. <laughs> living back home. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in some sense, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a bittersweet thing because it's like, I built this thing, you know, and we built it together, but now we're selling it and there's also a lot of kind of fear, like, what am I going to do next? And, um. But at the same time, a lot of excitement too, you know? Yeah. And the cool thing is – so a lot of people ask, you know, why I sold my stores as well. And right. a big part of it is if I'm not growing it, it's it's not going to be worth more, you know, a year from now or two years from now. Like, Yeah. You either... Right. Exactly. That's – yeah. That's what I was thinking about too. Go ahead. Yeah. So it's either I can get a guaranteed, you know, two or three-year payment now and then build another right. store or do something else, you know, or right. I can kind of just – get comfortable and then see what happens. But you know, that's, that's kind of, I think kind of just built into my personality is like, once I get into a state of being comfort, comfortable, it's, I need to just push out and, and throw myself into the, into chaos and it, it, it create something more out of it. 
Um, and I've kind of noticed that pattern. I think maybe it's kind of the same for you as well. Yeah, I mean, I just get bored. I, I think it's yeah, maybe yeah. it's a bad habit to be honest, because I'd probably yeah. like have a easier life. Maybe I'll even make more yep. money if I just did one thing and just kept that's, doing it. That's but, what I think is yeah. yeah I, I I struggle with that too. And and I mean, a lot of times I think I mean, how many people would kill to have something like you or I had, you know? And then we're just like, yeah, we're just gonna sell it to Empire Flippers, and then we're gonna go to Ukraine, or we're gonna go to you know, whatever country you want to go to. And it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, in some sense it sounds crazy, but um, I, I guess if, you know, w- w- when you're in the kind of lifestyle you and I are in, it's just kind of normal. Yeah. And at the same time, like, it, I'm thinking about my, you know, my deathbed, right? When I'm 90. Right. Right. It, I could either look back and be like, okay, you know, I built a business. I like lived at home, saved money. It, you know, did well. Right. And I just, that's, that's all I did and then now I'm 90 or yeah, exactly. I've exactly. lived in, you know, all these different countries. I learned different languages, right. you know, I yes. got to explore the world. I think yes. I'd rather do that. That's that I, I have been struggling and thinking and, and parsing this through my brain the past year. And that's exactly the conclusion I've come to. It's like, I've life's an insane adventure and I want to live it that way. I, I don't want to be like you said on, on your deathbed at 90. It's like, Oh yeah, I made this comfortable business and yeah, we have like 10 employees, but you didn't do anything, you know. You just answered the phone and did emails. It's like uh, I don't want to live my, live my life that way. I mean, it's it's okay if you do. I mean, I I do appreciate some people who have that drive to just take a build a business and just take it through the roof and just stay steady on it. There's some there's something for that steadfastness that people can stay on one thing and to do it prolonged. But um, I think with the way the world has changed now, like. Are just so inundated with options of, of how we want to live our lives, you know? Yeah, I can see that. So I guess one question that people are going to ask is, if your business is online, like, why can't you just move to Asia and continue doing it? Yes, absolutely. That's that's an awesome question. Thanks for asking. Uh, there's, there's a few reasons. Um, one of them was, mine is pretty technical, like dealing with some technical issues with customers and being able to answer the phone right away kind of have to be there of course then you're going to say well you could hire somebody to answer phones but then i have to train them and how am i going to trust them and i had another buddy who did that and the person worked for like another like a week or two and then quit and um it it was just honestly it was just a huge weight on my shoulders that was just pushing me down on on a daily basis and um i i had too much fear that if i had gone overseas and ran this business there would just be too many, um, uh, you know, maybe chargebacks or too many mistakes that would happen that I'm not in the same time zone. And I guess I just didn't have enough trust to train somebody to, to, to do that part. And think of it this way is, you know, I have my partner. I also have our VA, Roselle, and I have to pay now another person. So now we're, you know, uh, you know less profit margin. So I just, we both felt that, it was just time to sell it and, um, you know, celebrate it as a victory, which it is, um, and, you know, move on to the next thing. Okay. I don't know. If, does that make sense? Yeah, you know, it definitely makes sense. And I think it was a it was a good move to do it. I think it's also – I'm pretty sure that if you if you did move and you would have figured out a way to continue Probably it. Probably would have figured it out. You know, like just off the top of my head, a couple of things you could have done is – you could have hired um, like a cheaper like phone support. Like I, right. I like I had someone through conversational where I, which I paid like 150 bucks a month, and they right. they would basically just be like a really good secretary that would right. have like an FAQ, and then anything they couldn't answer, they would just say like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." Like, um, you know, like Josh can answer that. C- can you call you back uh, yes. in a few hours or send that's, an email? That's that's why I should have had like a coaching call with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's what see. That, that that that's also probably one of the the weaknesses or mistakes on my part is not reaching out and being flexible enough to get some advice in that regard you know because just like, just like what you said just right now we, we probably could have done that and it would have been okay but uh well we didn't do that so yeah that's okay cuz i mean at the end of the day you still end up cashing out how, how much do you end up yeah. selling the store for uh 45k okay nice good amount of yeah. money yeah, that, I mean, bad. that's basically like a full year salary for a lot of people yeah. working in the U.S. Or like yeah. 10 year salary for a lot of people working in the Philippines or in yeah. Asia or here in Ukraine. And the, the other cool thing, too, it's not like, 
you know, just sell it and then now you're just going to be hemorrhaging money when, when you go to travel overseas because when, I, when I'm going to go back to Asia, I'm going to still be working. So it's not like I'm just going to be, you know, bleeding money, you know, every month. I'll, I'll still be teaching. And actually, one thing I wanted to ask you is, like, what about doing Upwork stuff, Upwork.com? Like, I do have an Upwork account. Um, is it fairly easy to, to start, like, working with Upwork if I was living in Thailand or something and maybe helping other people run their e-commerce store? Yeah, definitely. You, you can absolutely do that. Or you can even just start another store and then right. do one that's less technical. And that way you don't have to be on the phone as much. Right. Yeah, right. but there's there's so many options. I, I guarantee, like once you get out there, and especially you have this buffer. So, right. like, you know, forty five thousand dollars is quite a bit of money, and right. that you know, and the cost of living in like Thailand, for example, is so cheap that like yeah, even exactly. If you, yeah, even if you just use that as a buffer and then start something else, I guarantee you'll right. be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm I'm not too worried. I'm not too worried about it. I'm just sometimes I do worry about retirement and things like that. But um, I, I'm sure it'll be okay. I'm sure, you know, just meeting new people and getting inspiration. That was the other thing, too, is like just being in this basement all day. Like this is coming into lifestyle, uh, you know, health kind of issues where you're not getting enough vitamin D. Um, and I just feel like the food here is so bad, even if you're, when I'm eating really healthy food. And uh, I just yeah. missed the lifestyle in, in like, for example, like in Thailand or something. Where you're always outside, you're in the sunshine, you're playing, you're swimming, you're exercising, and it I, for me, I think at this point it's about that work-life balance, that lifestyle balance, where you're you're, you're you've got all your healthy lifestyle things in place: your sleep, your food, your sunshine, um, and good good community around you, good happy smiling people around you, and when you have all those things, and then you're going to do some work. Like, how much more effective and productive would you be? And I mean, that's what I imagine your life is like, you know. Yeah, definitely. And and I think being that being around other people who are living this life, it's so much easier. Like and, yeah. and you see you start seeing so many opportunities. Right. Just, and you know, you meet people doing different things and you're like, Oh, I could do that too. And right. you know, also if you invest that money that you made, like and that's earning now interest or earning, you know, or growing, like that's right. another a stream of passive income that can cover right. your rent in Thailand because Thailand's not that expensive. Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, it's really cheap. Actually, I wanted to spend a few months, a couple months at least in Sri Lanka. Um, and that's even cheaper, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so cheap there. Um, yeah. And, and I really loved it there. And unfortunately, they, they yeah. have this kind of I know they bad situation big... right now. Yeah. And, so I'm going to – hopefully yeah. I'll still be able to go. I'm still monitoring that. But um... Yeah. I mean, hopefully it's it's one of those things where it happened once and then – it won't happen again. Um, right, they're gonna they're gonna tighten up security. Yeah, but at the same time, it it really sucks that it happened to them because yeah, it's really 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 heartbreaking. Yeah, but um, you know, at the same time, like how many people, like how many you know school shootings are there in the U.S. all the time now, and like it's exactly. going off. It sucks, but yeah, it's part of it is I think news like this normally ten years ago we never would have heard of anyways. So right. It's not that it necessarily happens more often now. It's just that we hear about it instantly. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's really interesting you brought that up. I just heard a, a statistic about, like, for example, police shootings in, like, New York. And, like, back in the 70s, it was, like, like 400 a year, some astronomical number. And now it's down to, like, I think they're under, like, 20 a year. But with the way social media is and the outrage is, is that, you know, you it feels like it's it's just happening every day. You know. Yeah. So. So yeah, I mean that's a big part of it as well. So a lot of it is kind of the gamble. Um, I mean personally, if I really wanted to be in, if I was in Sri Lanka right now, still like I, I was almost going to just stay there and and surf, I would just stay still. I wouldn't be that. I wouldn't stress about it. I would just say like, okay, I'm not going to be in the, right. the capital, um, yeah. hang out in government buildings, but I'll be on the beach surfing in Relegama, right. which is like a little surf town. And I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't stress. I wouldn't worry. But what, if I had the option now of going or waiting a few months, mm-hmm. you know, I feel bad for them and their economy. But I would probably wait a few months and just go somewhere else for a few months right. first. I would, I was, wonder, I wanted to ask you, what about India? So I've really been looking into Goa and Varkala, which is in Varkala Beach, which is in Kerala, southern part of India. Have you ever thought about going there, or I I haven't been. Everyone I know who's been to Goa really likes it, but it's I think it's too wild for me. It's too many people. I think this is uh, why I really liked Nepal and I liked Sri Lanka is because right. 
I had a lot of the benefits of Indian culture, like good Indian food. Right, and, that's what I like. But without being in India and dealing with, you know, yeah. 7 billion people. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I was I am still so stoked about Sri Lanka, man, because it's, you know, from from my experiences of of being in Asia and, you know, being in Thailand a lot, it's like you have that amazing beach vibe but without tons of people and, you know, it's well, at the time, it was safe, smiling, nice people, um, uh, great weather, and all those benefits, but without a lot of the negatives. And you said, you said, I asked you in a private message, or no, on your Facebook, you said that you liked Sri Lanka better than Bali. Oh, yeah, for sure. A hundred times better. And, I, think, uh, I think Bali still looks better in Instagram photos, and it's closer right. to Australia, so it'll always be more popular, especially because it's just kind of cool to go to Bali. Like, everyone's like, oh, right. you've made it. You're in Bali. Right, right. But... Sri Lanka is better in every other way. <laughs> wow. Yeah, man, I really cannot wait to go. There's so much like diversity there, like all kinds of like different they got, you know, like jungle life and like safaris and they got the beach and I mean, well, you know more than I. So Yeah, it, it really like in in one country you have like it's crazy that like you normally countries either have good surfing or they have good you know, animal life like safaris right. you know, or they have good like scuba diving or they have good something else. Right. Sri Lanka literally has everything. Yeah, that's you what know? I that's what I gathered. I would say the only thing, in, actually, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Colombo has a big city life too, but like basically, like you know, beach wise has decent scuba diving, has good snorkeling, right. has like great just kind of nature itself. It has safaris. It has like like the best animal safaris outside of Africa, and wow. it's so much cheaper. Wow. Yeah, th- that that was the other thing too. Is like. Like from what I all the research and what I looked into, it's like for the price, like you can't beat it. Like oh, it's insane! All those, it's yeah. insane. I think I paid like fifty dollars to go on a jeep safari where I huh? saw wild elephants and like wild birds and like wild boar. You know, all oh. the things like a lot of the things that you would want to see like in Africa on a safari that would cost like a thousand dollars or at least a couple sure. hundred bucks. You know? Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So, dude, I, I'm I'm really uh, happy for you because. Now if it feels like you're fi- you're finally like I think you did it kind of the the opposite way where you first tasted right. Asia and you're like okay I like it yes and then you went back to work and like okay I'm gonna grind it out <laughs> make some money you know try right. this online thing and then I'm gonna go right. back and then start it right I think a lot right. of people yeah. you know uh, they just show up <laughs> they just show up in Chiang Mai right. they're like okay I'm here like where's you know like where's my business or how do I start I have no skills I have no money I'm not willing right. to <laughs> I'm not willing to spend money on a course or learn. I just just hand me something. Well, right. I think you're in the exact opposite situation. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's you got to work for it. <laughs> um I I think like honestly like going to Korea as an English teacher just has just opened up so many doors, you know, just meeting people like you uh and and many other people and just showing me the world in a different way from just staying here, you know, in, in the USA and uh and just you know, living, going to a, a different country like like Korea and learning language and and just learning how to navigate that alone just gives you so many skills you know that they can translate to you know other things you know like living in Thailand and doing online work or whatever. Yeah, definitely. And you know, you've proven to yourself that you can do it. You know, that you've built yeah. a business that you've were smart enough to run it. And you cash out right. on it. Uh, what right. are you actually doing with your money? Are you are you is it just in a bank account or did you invest it in something? I mean, I just got the transfer in maybe a week ago, and I'm not even really thinking about it right now. It's just sitting in there. I'm, uh, I'm just, just just kind of focusing. It's, it's just, I, I'm, I'm sure it's nice, you know, looking into your bank account and not seeing like, yeah. you know, three hundred bucks or like negative seven thousand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a really great feeling of like security, and it's you know, it's a great feeling of like you know, job well done. I accomplished something. But at the same time, it's like this is just the first step. Yeah. And was the forty five thousand dollars like the total sale of the store, or what? Like, what was your part of it? Oh, the oh, so yeah, we just split it. Okay. So you each got twenty two thousand. Yeah. Some like yeah. Let me think. Be- yeah, almost twenty grand because I think there. So when the new owners took over, uh, some of the money from it's hard to explain, but. So some 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 of their some of their sales, like got, some of their revenue, got transferred into our bank account because they hadn't 
Oh, like, I you know, see. Through the migration process, <clears throat> they hadn't they hadn't set up all their accounts properly yet. So then they they deducted that. But yeah, like it it still evens out to around there. But ah, but also wait a minute, I forgot. There's the fifteen percent fee from Empire Flippers, mm-hmm. right? So that like Empire Flippers takes fifteen percent. So I think the total was like nineteen something. Okay, that's still pretty good. That that's still twenty grand. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can go out and buy a new car if you want, or you can save yeah, it no up. Yeah, no way. <laughs> why would I? Why would I waste my money on a new car? I know. So um, my advice to you would be sign up for an online bank, either Ally or Marcus, because yeah. they pay two point two five percent interest. Oh wow! And it's just a normal savings account, so you can you can keep you know a couple grand in your checkings account for you know whenever you need, and then just put the rest while you decide what to do with it uh, in in you know. I use Marcus, but you can use any of them. Uh, sure. And then you just start earning some money at least. So, oh yeah, and I wanted to ask you, that, that that's great advice, thank you. But I wanted to ask you, so when you sold your store, when you sold your, when you sold your dropship store, did you, like you, did you, you paid capital gains tax on that, right? Uh, or what, like, yes, what did I, you do? I think the first mm-hmm. one I, I did, and it's kind of sucked because it was what, 15% or something? Right, 16%, I think. Yeah, but then the second store, I had I took advantage of the foreign earned income exclusion, oh. so I was living in Thailand for eleven months of the year, uh, and that way I I was I basically got I, I was responsible for zero uh, federal tax for the first hundred uh-huh. grand I made, and I think wow. that included the I'm not sure if that included the capital gains tax because that mm-hmm. might be like an investment income, but whatever it was, right. I ended up paying way less tax the, the second time around just because I was out of the U.S. I, I need to get on that program where, what is it? What, what's that called? The foreign exclusion? What yeah, is it? foreign earned income exclusion. Foreign earned in- income exclusion. So that's, you have to be outside of the U.S. for eleven months. one year? The, 11 months 11 of the months. year. Yeah, so you can go home to visit, go home for Christmas, but just right. be out for 330 days. Right. I need to get on that program. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's nice. And I also moved to Texas, which is a tax-free state. So that helps All a lot. Right. So did you, did you like fly into Texas and like get a Texas like uh, like address? Yeah. Or? So basically I went there for New Year's to, to meet this girl that I was – I met in Chiang Mai actually. But she was like, uh-huh. oh, yeah, come you know, hang out with me. I live in Austin. Um, uh-huh. And I was like, well, you know, I've been thinking about moving to Austin like to get, you know, to get my, my regis, like residence out. Right. California. I was like, okay, yeah, two birds with one stone. <laughs> yeah, there you go. English <laughs> so, lessons with yeah. Johnny. <laughs> so I flew there, I think a few, like a day before uh, New Year's Eve. We hung uh-huh. out, we partied. On, I think, January 2nd, I went to the DMV, gave you know gave back my California driver license, got a Texas license, opened a Texas bank account at the local credit union, and wow. like got an address there, like an RV spot actually, like a legal, <laughs> whatever the, the cheapest legal domicile I could find was. <laughs> And nice. I was like, okay, I live in Texas now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, it's like what they don't want you doing is doing that and then like going back to California for nine months of the year. But right. I haven't been in California for like a whole year. And anyway. like for the last four right. years, I think I've been in California for like 10 days. So hmm. it's, uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a legal resident of Texas, but I'm living, you know, out of my backpack wherever, right, right. wherever I want. Well, and that's that's the other beautiful thing that I, I really like about that that lifestyle um, is it's minimal it's minimalistic. I mean, here you know, being back in the states for three and a half years, like you just see like all this shit people have, and like it, it, even that I have accumulated with my fishing addiction. Um, yeah, you know, you know what's crazy? I constantly so I've, buying I've, stuff. I've seen these big fish on your Facebook. Yeah, I like, and I know how expensive it is to yes. buy the equipment. And then yeah. to go out like on these expeditions. Well, my my buddy has a boat, so it that really helps. Okay. But I I catch most of them from shore actually. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lake Michigan is like the best freshwater fishery in the world because of the salmon and the trout species that we have. Okay, nice. Um, but I mean, either way, if you just like catching big ass fish in Thailand, <clears throat> like even in Chiang Mai, there are these lakes that are I know, stocked. I've been there. Oh my god. Yeah, and those it, giant catfish. They were so big. They're like I know. <laughs> 40 pounds or something, right? 50, even more. Like some of them are up with like 70, 80 pounds. That's insane. And yeah. it's yep. so cheap. I know. I know. 
that I mean that kind of fishing is really fun thing to do with friends and maybe sit around drink some beers and reel in some big fish but um it's kind of like fishing in an aquarium because it's so easy you know those ponds are stocked the the really challenging fishing in Thailand is to go wild giant snakehead fishing up in the northern parts and I, I did that oh wow and w- yeah, we fished like for literally almost 12 hours, lots of casting, it's very technical, and I got one, and it was like about 10 or 11 pounds, and that that feeling of just getting that one was just amazing, because, okay. you know, I've never done that type of fishing before, it was very challenging, and, and getting that was just really, really sporting, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I can imagine that, but and how much did that cost you for that trip? That was like three hundred dollars. Okay, so uh, it, because, it was pretty expensive, but it was. I mean, they're taking yeah. you deep in the jungle, and they're taking you for twelve right. hours. So, yes, yeah. I mean, it's if you if you compare it to what you'd pay here in America, it's like roughly the same. Uh, in some cases, a little bit cheaper because he picked me up at my hotel, and then he picked me up at like four in the morning. This was in Chiang Mai, and then we drove up to like Lampang, something like that, which is like two or three hours north, and then we launched his boat fished all day then he drove back and then you know including some you know all the food and gas and all that so it, it makes sense okay yeah it definitely makes sense and i'm sure that was a a trip kind of a lifetime as well oh yeah i mean it's way out of the ordinary way off the beaten track um and it was it was awesome i, I really enjoyed it okay cool well i'm sure there's gonna be a lot more adventures for you uh coming up next so i'm excited for yeah, wherever wait. you're gonna end up being Thanks. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And maybe uh, I'll see you at the next uh, Dropship Lifestyle Retreat. It's going to be in Prague this September. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll be there. Yeah. So it'd be cool to meet uh, other, other people doing it. Because as kind of you mentioned before, like it's mostly just normal people who are part of the course and just are you know running these online stores. And right. most of them don't post. Most of them just like yes, they're like yeah. you know moms, you know, or like yeah. stay-at-home dads, and like they just yeah. run their business. And like some of them are doing like a hundred grand in sales a month, but it's they're just doing it. Like it's they're not posting. Like I never, I I think I only posted maybe three or four times, and it I just was asking some maybe technical question about how do I you know I I don't know, but it, I was asking some question, but you know I never was saying like oh look at me like. I have no problem with people showing their success, but you know, I wasn't, it just didn't really occur to me to do that. You know, I just wanted to, I needed some information that I was posting about and just going about my daily business and just trying to de- decrease my time on Facebook anyway, you know? Yeah. And I, I realized that like people that travel are on Facebook a lot, just, you know, mo- mostly to keep in touch, but also share like travel photos, but people that right. live, you know, in the U S or live in Canada or live back home, wherever that is. And they mm-hmm. run a business, you know, or they have a family, like they don't have time like or a reason to post right. all day on Facebook. So the people yeah. that people hear from, like and, and this is why I actually the, the the honest reason why I go to the DSL like in person retreat every year is just to meet people who are doing it and are successful and right. to just like be around normal people. Because right, if right, I right. just focus, if I just like hang out in YouTube comments or on Reddit or on Facebook groups, it seems like nobody is doing anything. You know, everyone's like giving up or everyone's like, oh, like, oh, it's not working. It's not whatever. But then when you go to these They're conferences. They're spending all their time on social media not yeah, working. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But then you go to these conferences <laughs> and you meet like a dozen people who are doing 30 grand a month and you're like, oh, like it's working and it's working fine. And right. like – it's and I've never heard from this person or seen them post anything, but they're a real person, so this is cool. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, hopefully, hopefully, I can make it. Um, I, I, I guess it. I might be doing a like just a little one month summer English camp in Malaysia. Okay. Um. So, which is just a nice thing to have in my back pocket in case you know I just want to. I think it's like I don't know a few grand. Uh. That's I think that's in August. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I hopefully I can I can make it, dude. That I, I really want to hook up with you soon, man. Yeah, that'd be fun. It'd be fun to hang out. And for everyone else yeah. who's listening, if you guys want to join in the course, uh, it's called Dropship Lifestyle. But you can use my link. It's AntonMethod.com, and the retreat is going to be the first week of September. But it's for members only. And my advice is to get your store up and running and at least make your first sale before you go because. What you'll learn at the conference is how to scale it up. So if you haven't put in the work yourself, if you haven't called a supplier yet or you haven't you know, 
put in the effort, all you're going to meet is people telling you to get off your ass and call a supplier. Right. So, yeah. you know, if, you, if you're if serious about starting an online business, go to AntonMethod.com, uh, sign up for the course, go through the whole thing, just follow the damn course because it works. Yeah. You know? And, you know, Josh is just like Josh is number like 200 person that I've met who has been successful with it. So I know it works. And congrats to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, also, guys, if you guys do create a Shopify account, which is the hosting we use for e-commerce, you can use my link. It's Shopify.com slash Johnny FD. And that's it. Uh, ciao, guys. And see you all next week. Oh, by the way, how do you say bye in uh, Korean? Annyeonghi. I just say Anyang. Anyang. Ajima Pachinge. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.